Good afternoon, everybody. My name's, my name's Simon. I'm from uh, Bantanova. And uh, this afternoon, I'm here to uh, present to you the ultimate showdown in hosting. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that this is a panel session and it is on the business and strategy track. It is a non-technical presentation, okay? So if you're expecting deep technical insight into uh, hosting solutions, this isn't where you should be. But if you want to learn about making hosting decisions and the right place where you should host your projects, then uh, this will give you some good insight for that. Um, I'd like to explain the, uh, the fight rules for this afternoon. Um, this is not a debate, it's going to be a point-by-point -point review of the key hosting decision drivers, okay? So this afternoon we're going to present points for these three options. Traditional hosting, uh, kind of DIY, build your own, uh, managed hosting service, and platform as a service, okay? So, I'd like to introduce to you, from the white corner, representing Platform as a Service, Aaron from Aberdeen Cloud, a PAS provider. In the black corner, representing Bare Metal in-house, Rupert from Arrow, a B2B publisher. And in the blue corner, representing managed hosting, it's Greg from Code Enigma, a development and hosting company. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask these three guys to briefly explain their platform. Then after that, we're going to go through points, looking at the benefits and disadvantages of each of them. So, uh, over to you, Aaron. All right. So, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Nice to see the turnout. Uh, Aberdeen Cloud, we provide a platform as a service. It's a cloud hosting and development solution. It is out of the box, ready to go. Everything from very small sites to enterprise level solutions. Um, oh, wow. My microphone's really loud. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Greg from Code Enigma. Um, we uh, tend to be more on the managed service side, so we help people manage their own infrastructure potentially or um, manage infrastructure that we've helped them to set up. Uh, sometimes it's in the cloud, sometimes it's bare metal, um, but it's not uh, a platform like Aaron's. Hi, I'm Rupert. I'm a web developer for a business-to-business -business pub uh, publisher called Arrock. Uh, we run five-ish sites. Um, we sell basically niche information for specific industries like automotive, food, drink, and style. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. <laughs> okay, so the first thing, round one, capital expenditure, aka CapEx. Right, so I did skip it. <coughs> so we recently relaunched one of our biggest sites, and to do that, we built a new infrastructure for it. And we had a fairly low capital expenditure for that because we had a lot of what we needed already. So we have an office with about 50 people in it and you have that many people in an office, you have a pretty big pipe into it. So it's pretty easy just to slip another server into the rack and set up our infrastructure on that. And you're probably thinking, well, a new server, that's money. But all our servers come off eBay. And that might sound insane, but the reason we do that is one of the guys in the office, he's really good at sort of sourcing hardware, making sure it works, setting it up right, and stick it in the rack so us developers can take it over. So for a pretty low expenditure, we have a crazy overpowered server, it's like an eight core Xeon with 32 gig of RAM, and we have an identical one sitting next to it, which we can either switch to or cannibalize as appropriate. All right, so our take on capital expenditure is, um, it's not just buying the, the bare metal and the actual uh, servers and everything to make everything work, which it often is thought of, but uh, upfront costs and capex, we're also talking about the biggest part of that expenditure, and that is exactly the people and their salaries that it takes to set up those systems. So the people who design the systems, 
purchase the parts, put everything together, test the stuff, install the software, configure, tune, and tweak. That's all money that has to come out of pocket when you're not using the cloud. So with the cloud services or platform services, you don't have to come up with a sizable investment uh, to pay for the hardware or the salaries for the people to design the systems and implement the architecture. It's actually a pay-as-you-go. From the moment you sign up, uh, you just pay for what you use. And most companies today don't even require a minimum contract. Okay, well, I mean, I, I can see um, both sides of that argument. Um, from our perspective, uh, I think the, the whole CapEx argument shifts depending on what you're trying to do. Um, for example, if you're an agency that's got lots of websites, um, you could potentially run them all on a small cluster of servers or something like that, then it's going to be more cost effective to do it that way than it will be to run them on a platform where you have to pay per site. So if you're in a reseller situation, if you're in a situation where you've got a lot of websites to host, but each website doesn't actually need very much resource, you're probably better off with your own machines, whether that's managed or, or you're managing them yourselves, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a sliding scale, um, depending on how many sites you've got, what kind of traffic they're handling, um, whether you've got internal resource already, like Rupert does, or if not, as Aaron says, some people don't, or, or the training up would be expensive, so, so it varies. Round, round two, flexibility. <laughs> so um, I, I carry on at this point. Um, I think in terms of flexibility, uh, what um, an organization like ours offers is pretty much second to none because essentially what we do is manage Linux servers for people. So if you've got a development team that just want to kind of get in there and use um, the, the software, uh, what we allow you to do is basically forget about all of the running of Linux and all of that stuff it doesn't matter whether it's your own servers or whether it's something that's been put in the cloud um, on virtualized hardware, it, it makes no difference. The point is that they're your servers managed by you and you can do whatever you like with them. Uh, all, all we do is manage the backups and, and, and the keeping things up to date and the security and everything else. We let you worry about running Drupal on top of that. So yeah, we can run pretty much whatever we like and, and we do. So our current platform is, is Debian 6, Varnish, Nginx, Memcache, Pacona, Solar, Ticker, and Prince XML. And if you haven't heard of the last two, because they're probably the oddballs there, Ticker is a thing that extracts meaning from documents, and Prince XML is a tool for producing PDFs. And they're kind of the oddballs in the stack. They are what you know a platform couldn't provide. So you know we have all those things set up exactly as our application needs it. And if we want to add a new service in the future to you know, support a new feature, we absolutely can. So I think this is where self-hosting beats anything else. Okay, so flexibility. Um, yeah, cloud platform loses this one. Uh, we don't really give people all the access to things, some of our special sauce in the background. But I would say, to be fair, it would only be by the smallest of margins. Um, Cloud platforms are meant to be closed systems, and the reason for that is they're not servers, right? They're distributed systems. So although true distributed systems, they will include specialized nodes that uh, serve one, ded one dedicated fu function and only that function, custom apps and services run on separate server nodes. So it's much more inflexible as a system. Um, but I don't know, I, I would say it's definitely, in our mind, it's more secure that way because suppose your Ruby-based ticketing system has a bug which a hacker uses to break into the server. Well, there isn't much to do since the app runs on its own dedicated server node. And most of your data, code, and content will remain secure on their own server nodes. Round three, skill sharing. So um, let's me to lead off on this one again. Um, skill sharing is an interesting one. Uh, I guess it matters more to myself and Rue than it, it does to Aaron, uh, insofar as that um, obviously because we're uh, providing machines, and in Rupert's case there's internal machines um, that have Linux on, uh, then there's a degree of knowledge required there. Now, I see this as an opportunity because a lot of our customers will already have very good IT teams in place, 
that are already managing infrastructure for them that may not be Linux infrastructure, it may be something else, or typically it's Microsoft. Um, and there's an opportunity here to actually transfer our knowledge um, to uh, our customers' teams. Uh, we're used to doing on-site training, we're used to mentoring people and taking them through the experience of shifting from other hosting solutions onto managed Linux servers. And um, I think you, you, know, you grow the value of your team um, by taking that approach because actually they can learn as your business changes technology. Uh, and that adds value to them and it adds value to you. Yeah, so uh, I, would actually, I would actually list this as a trade-off or I think from our perspective, it would be a trade-off because on the one hand, while I completely agree with Greg's comments about skills sharing, uh, our perspective would be that it's a plus to not need this, to not need to be able to do skills sharing. The impact of not needing specialized skills uh, and, and also specialized systems is twofold. Uh, first of all, the absence of having system administrators and specialists on your, on your team no longer prevents you from competing at the enterprise level. Uh, it puts enterprise contracts within the reach of the average development shop without having specialized personnel. So in realistic terms, it means that a handful of talented Drupal devs uh, with nothing more than a credit card and their own talent could be chasing and winning contracts at the same level as some of the uh, bigger companies. The second part of that would be, it's sad to say, but considering the economic uncertainty of the time that we live in, every dollar, euro, check, crown, whatever local currency you're using that you spend on the business is money out of the business's pocket. So the fact is, adding people and trying to improve productivity by having specialists is an expensive approach. Specialists can be very expensive and the plain and simple fact is pause systems remove the need for sysadmin specialists. So like Greg said, skills sharing is pretty much essential to how we operate as a business. So we're a relatively small team, you know, we're quite experienced and we have a lot of overlap just to reduce the fuss factor. Um, so, like I said, I'm a developer there, and personally, I like operating in an environment where I have to learn things. You know, it's why I do what I do, it's fun. And we're a slowly growing company, and the bosses frequently say they don't want to grow the business too fast, because you know, they want to avoid the, the tendency to boom and bust as a business. Um, so yeah, Aaron's right, you know, we're not going to be serving you know, thousands of pages tomorrow. You know, we're not going to be getting in enterprise stuff tomorrow, but the business is slowly going to grow. And as a team, we can grow with the traffic and the demands on the system and scale up with it. Okay, next point, uh, physical control. All right, I'll take the lead on this one. Physical control. There is no argument. I have, nothing, <laughs> I have no argument there. If you want to tinker with hardware, Pause is not the right solution for you, okay? Um, pause is built so that you don't have to tinker with hardware. So I cannot reiterate that enough. If you like to tinker, pause is not the right thing. If, <laughs> if you just want to get in and do some Drupal dev stuff, okay, it might be a faster approach. So pause systems are typically built on, type, on top of some sort of cloud offering. You have to... Remember, I think, actually, we might have, I might have skipped a point before. <coughs> Cloud offerings usually come in the form of just infrastructure, then platforms, and then softwares. So Pause is, is built on top of a Cloud offering, usually a infrastructure like Amazon, Rackspace. So therefore, anytime you use Pause, you're also subject to the availability of the initial Cloud provider. If you use one without multiple data centers, you may experience increased latency, non-compliance with certain government <coughs> regulations, and you might not have true high availability. Uh, it's always good practice to look at these things before signing any sort of contracts. So yeah, self-hosting pretty much wins physical control. If you want to go and give your server a good kicking, you absolutely can. Um, although, you know, it's obviously not a huge advantage. Servers don't really like that. And, you know, I work remotely, so, 
for all I know, the servers might actually be in a data centre somewhere, even though they're actually <coughs> just upstairs in the office. Um, where there is a big advantage, there is in transparency, which is a sort of control. So because we built these servers and everything around them, we know exactly what's set up there. You know, if you're using someone's PaaS and they say they're highly available, are they highly available at every level of the stack that you want? Um, if they're saying they're doing backups, are they sticking to the backup routine they promise? You know, we know that we are because we're doing it. Um, one slight downside is obviously physical control doesn't necessarily mean move, you know, doing stuff physically to the machine. Um, on something like, you know, a cloud service, you may be able to pick up a machine and move it to a different data center, which you can't really do if you've got an actual box. You know, it takes an hour. Because they need a van. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, uh, I know, uh, I'm glad that um, Aaron uh, brought up the point about the different uses for the cloud and, you know, platform being one and infrastructure being another. Um, from our perspective, when we're managing servers for people, um, it doesn't make uh, a great deal of difference to us where that, where that server is. Um, so, you know, it could be your existing infrastructure or it could be that actually you want to leverage um, some of the power of the cloud but only at an infrastructure level, in which case, you know, you might uh, want to commission some virtual machines and have those managed. Um, so we kind of offer a trade-off uh, and you can go as far as you like. You can either go completely into the cloud and say, okay, we want everything virtualized or you can say, actually, you know what, we've bought our own service but we really don't want the hassle of having to deal with these. So we like the fact that they're physically here in our basement and we like the fact that we're controlling the bandwidth and all this kind of stuff, um, but uh, we don't want to be bothered with managing Linux. Um, and, you know, that's, that's quite a common um, uh, approach for uh, a lot of companies. Um, in terms of when we do go into the cloud, we, we have preferred suppliers, of course, um, but, I mean, we can really uh, run these things anyway. I mean, that's, that's the point. It, it goes back a little bit to the flexibility stuff, but, you know, you can have the physical control and still have the kind of management that, that allows you to maybe have a, you know, a, a reduced um, system administration team. Um, and the other thing I would say is uh, with our model you have kind of full access to all the software so you know you can check up on us um, just like Rue was saying with a, with a, with a platform um, you've just kind of got to take their word for it that they're doing all the things that they said they do uh, whereas with us you know you have full access to the monitoring you have full access to the, uh, to the, the backups the backup locations uh, you can run your own restores if you want you know it's all it's, it's quite transparent it's almost as though you're hosting yourself Okay, round five, separation. So this is a point where we have a bit of risk because we use the same connectivity for our servers that we do for our office stuff. <coughs> and, you know, if all my colleagues decided to fire up YouTube at the same time, I don't know what would happen to the website. Um, obviously, if you're co-located, that doesn't apply. Um, so, you know, once you've got to the servers, because you have total control over the servers, you can separate things how you like, you know. You can stick everything in one box. You can have a box per machine. Uh, you can build your own little private cloud if you wanted. So, you know, you can separate things how you like. Uh, to you, Greg? Oh, is it me? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so yeah, so on the separation side of things, um, I think uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, because, of our, because of our flexibility, again, with the, with the management service, um, it, sometimes it depends on the way the client has decided to lay things out, and sometimes it, it, it's down to us. Um, obviously, if you put stuff in the cloud, um, even if it's just at that infrastructure level, you might have concerns about um, having potentially multiple VMs on a single physical machine. Um, that's certainly a possibility. Um, you don't, again, you're unlikely to have the level of transparency with an infrastructure cloud provider of the sort that we might use to know whether actually you're taking more of a risk than you think because you've, you've got four servers, but actually Rackspace or Linode, who, whoever it is you've contracted with, have put them all on the same physical machine. That is possible, you know. Um, so um, on the VM side of things, uh, we run some of the same risks that, that the platform might run, um, but obviously we don't have to take that route. We can use bare metal servers. Um, and in terms of the, the actual um, 
hardware separation, obviously what we sell and what we manage are individual separate machines. There's no shared resource on a single machine. You're never sharing uh, your resource with somebody else on that actual machine. It's always complete and utter separation. Own IP address, own MAC address on devices, etc. All that stuff is just, you know, from a security perspective, is completely isolated. All right. So yeah, um, that's a lot of that's true. Um, I would say both points. There, there. Sometimes there are, is a lack of separation. A uh, lot of a lot of PAWS offerings are set up as a shared system. Uh, in these cases, the provider has <coughs> created a shared architecture that is, um, it allows the end user to utilize a shared resource point, point uh, sorry, pool. So why would they do that? Well, when people set up pause like that, they do it because it drives the cost down, right? You're able to utilize more processing power and pay less for it. So. The idea is to offer scalability and infrastructure scalability at a better price point. However, an important point about this is, I would say that's, that's actually a quite antiquated approach to utilizing cloud services. That's so 2011, right? It's, um, it's, it's a remnant of the era of shared servers and cheap hosting, okay? But most cloud services now, they're, they're moving beyond this. So I would say any decent pause platform is not a bunch of servers. And uh, physical resources are virtualized in these cases. So therefore, they're shared. The resource pools become dedicated. It's a, it's a distributed system, so it's a better approach. And if you're looking and considering pause, that's something that you might want to consider or you run into these lack of separation issues because there are many providers that are doing it that way, but you can also get distributed systems where you have dedicated resources. And that's, that's really sort of the way forward, at least in my opinion, for these sort of pause and cloud offerings. So, um, I don't know, I'd say if you, have, if you have no doubts about using uh, Rackspace or Amazon as it is now or, or any other cloud infrastructure that which actually provide you virtualized instances you shouldn't really be afraid of using cloud platforms either just do your homework first if it's that important of an issue for you. Round six scalability and uh, performance. Yeah so this one uh, I take the lead on that because well Again, smart cloud systems are designed to grow as you grow. And this can be both long-term growth and short-term growth. With uh, by, and I'll clarify, by long-term growth, I'm talking about sites, just sites themselves, that start out small over the course of its business lifetime. And as it becomes more and more popular, you need more and more resources. This could also be considered the same argument for any small development agency. You start out a couple of people, and over time, you need to keep adding resources. Well, that almost goes back to the CapEx argument, so I won't repeat myself there. But the idea is that you can just grow as needed instead of trying to anticipate how much growth that you're going to need. The second thing is the short term. And in the short term, I would say this is a big one because if you got, you know, uh, if, a, if any company here creates a great site and suddenly that site is featured in Wired Magazine and your traffic is about to go from 1,000 hits a day to a million hits a day, you need to be able to scale up to that sort of uh, traffic immediately. And again, a smart cloud system should allow you to provision those resources some, in some cases, literally just drag the slider bar where you want it to be and say how much computing resources you need. And by the time it updates into the cloud, you should be able to have enough computing resources to handle those kind of peak loads. So we're in a pretty unusual position with regards to scalability because we have total control over our traffic. And the reason for that is our site is subscription only. So we can predict our traffic levels and we can scale up as we need to. 
Um, as yet, we actually haven't had, had to because, right, like I said right back at the start, we've got our servers, we've got a really good deal on our servers and they're massively overspecified. So we know we have room to grow for the foreseeable future. Um, but if we were in a position where we couldn't predict our traffic to that level, I'd probably be looking at a cloud service. Well, I'll talk to Aaron. <laughs> or us. <laughs> Points. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we, 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 you know, it comes back to the whole thing of, well, what, what was your choice at the outset? Are you running bare metal um, hardware or uh, are you um, running on virtualized infrastructure? If you're running on virtualized infrastructure, sure. There's no way I can sit here and tell you that you can slide a slider and, and add five virtual machines to your layout. It doesn't work like that. We can scale. We can't scale as rapidly as a platform, but we can scale rapidly um, using um, the tools that are available these days, you know, the LibCloud API and Puppet and tools like this that allow you to build servers and deploy software onto them. You know, we can scale up a site in a matter of hours, not minutes, hours, but we, we can do it. Um, so, um, and I would make the point that nobody provides auto scaling that I'm aware of. Aaron may now say, hey, we do. I don't know. <laughs> Coming soon. Coming sure soon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, no, nobody uh, that I know of um, provides auto scaling. Somebody's still got to sit there and slide the slider. And at least with a managed service, you can be confident that you've got monitoring systems in place and you've got experts watching those machines and watching for load changes and being ready and enabled to react. Um, so, you know, we, we can provide a level of rapid scaling if the infrastructure choices were right. Um, so, yeah, it's not a one-horse race, but if you need to scale up and down really rapidly on a regular basis, you probably want a platform. All right. Ooh, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Round seven, uh, UX productivity. So basically, self-hosting has good UX if you think Bash has good UX. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Bash, but I'm a developer. Um, obviously, there's loads of other stuff you need to work out yourself, like you know how to order the right hardware, how to build your environment, you've got to learn your tools. You know, it, it's a long list. There's a lot of stuff that you need to learn. You know, you can't just go and get slide sliders and tick boxes. Kind of obvious. All right, so. Here's the thing, um, the way we look at it, user experience is the key to productivity. And um, yeah, I, I, I beat the same drum quite often, but one of my points is people are costly. So in order to increase productivity, is it best to add more human resources or add smarter processes and systems? Having all the tools that well, our opinion basically to answer that obviously would be UX is the key to your productivity as a, as a Drupal agency, as a uh, agency that creates new things. So having all the tools needed for most Drupal projects already configured and available in one simple, uh, either the graphical user interface or uh, in some cases you can also have a, your own command line interface fully integrated with the system and ha you know, having everything there available. You've got your Drush, you've got Git, you've got Solar, etc. All of those things just at the touch of a button or a line of code and enter. Um, the advantage of that results in an easy to use system that is designed for one goal. And that one goal is to increase or maximize your productivity. Um, I'd say that that's it's hard to even compare productivity to the sign up and go approach. If you have a good system and you're using a good system, you should be able to sign up and literally create a high availability website and push it live onto the net within 15 minutes. Doesn't mean that the site's gonna be a beautiful site winning any awards or anything, but you should have that sort of usability in a, in a good platform. So. And if, and if you don't think that's possible, I'll, I'll give you a, a link for a Drush archive right now, anybody that wants to try. The last time I did it, it took seven minutes and 50 seconds. So, and I'm not a techie, so you know, that's, that says a lot for productivity. Anyway, um, the last thing I would say is, if, can I see just a show of hands, has anybody 
ever actually built a distributed system? I think you, I know, right? Oh yeah. Anybody else? Sorry. Distributed systems? We got Pedro, number two. You know what are those? Yeah, so just a handful of people. And I mean, how many hours are lost? And I'm not gonna shout to everybody, but have, have any estimate on hours on setting up a distributed system? Oh yeah, I thought uh, the days. Days. <laughs> and did that even did that even include high availability? Yeah, that would include high right. availability. So the main point is every hour that you're spending some specialist to design these systems is an hour that you're losing on Drupal development. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I suppose you know on the UX side of things, um, starting at the more simplistic level, for sure um, we don't have the slick user interface of, of something like a platform service and pretty much all the platform providers have pretty sweet kind of built-in version control systems, high productivity tools, so you know, it's excellent. I, mean, you know, I can't deny it, I use them myself sometimes. Um, uh, it's, it's really, really good. Um, so, you know, we, we, we can't match that, but I guess what we do is we make it as usable as possible. So we try to provide tools, so for example, we provide um, continuous integration with a tool called Jenkins, which means that when your developers actually uh, have finished on a piece of code, they can just push it um, back into the central version control system and it builds automatically, which is kind of the same way as it works with, with the platform stuff except that ours is much more, you can see the wheels turning and the rods pushing and everything, whereas with the platform it's just all just, just happens by magic and there's just a little spinning disc in the corner. Um, so, you know, everything's a lot more exposed with us, but I think a lot of the, of, of the um, <coughs> tools are there and, and it's more a case of kind of getting used to um, the differences. Uh, and different ways of working and, and, and the fact that, you know, for example, you'll have to go and log into your monitoring over here and your CI over there and they won't just all be in one nice dashboard, they're in different places. We, we, we try to get around that with single sign-on solution, you know, you only have one account so that you log into everything with the same account and all of that stuff. So, you know, we do our best but it's no, um, it's no platform dashboard. Um, <coughs> But the, you know, I think that the, the key point there is what, what you lose in user, exp user experience, you gain in flexibility. And to circle back to the flexibility point, yeah, okay, we, uh, we don't have a fancy dashboard that you can, you can slide things up and down <coughs> and, and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, if you want to run Sugar CRM, no problem, just run Sugar CRM, it's a Linux server, it doesn't care. Um, so it depends on what you're, what you're doing. Okay, let's take a look at security. Okay, am I first on this one? Uh, I think it's me, actually. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, on the security side of things, I guess we, we straddle a line um, because we are, because we are not in total control of the hardware that we provide our service with ever, whether it's a customer's hardware or whether it's in the cloud, it's not ours, it's not our physical servers. So, you know, we have to take a certain amount of physical security for granted. We have to assume if it's virtualized infrastructure that the, 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 the organizations that are providing that infrastructure is doing things diligently, that the, uh, you know, that the underlying VMware is, uh, is, is well made and the virtual machines are well separated and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, we're only as secure as you know, the, the physical security of your server room, if you're Rupert, or the, uh, you know, the, 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 the physical, the, the online security of your Lino dashboard or whatever it is um, that you've decided to go with. Um, but, you know, having said that, um, it kind of goes back to the point that we were making before about um, sharing of resources. And the, the, there is no sharing of resources with other organizations with us. You know, your organization, your data, your servers, everything is just yours and the only people that can access those servers are our privileged um, system administrator staff and, and people that you tell us that can, uh, can and that, that's it. And we do all of the um, security updates and patching for you, we do that transparently. I think I'm fairly confident we've got you know stricter security and firewall protocols in place than pretty much anyone else. Um, and you know, we're um, 
as far as that's concerned, I think we're transparently and demonstrably more secure um, as a platform than, than most other people can be. Um, and even on the physical security side of things, at least if you ask us to commission um, hardware for you, virtualized or physical, it will be in an ISO 27001 data center. Right? It's not going to be in some basement um, or anything like that. It's, it's going to be in racks in proper physically secure data centers that are certified. So. Yeah, so, um, okay. Data security, I don't really actually consider this a con, even though it's a, a big hot topic around cloud stuff. Oh, it's in the cloud. We don't actually have the servers in our basement. And um, I mean, it's definitely a con in the mindset of people <coughs> that are still getting used to cloud ideas, for sure. And I don't, I don't invalidate that, but I would say it's, it's I call it smoke and mirrors approach, really. Uh, basically because of this. We all live in the, in the digital age. And the fact of living in the digital age is data security and vulnerability of information is a persistent danger in the world that we live in. And, um, you know, I, I would ask anybody that, that is worried about cloud s security, where do you really think your data is safer? In the system, and I, and I mean, no offense to Greg or anybody else who does it this way, but in a system that you and you know your great team built somewhere, whether it's in a secure location or not, or in a data center with you know somebody like uh, Amazon or Rackspace or something like that, that is literally investing billions of dollars every year to increase their security, to add machines, and not only on the physical side, but to hire the best and the brightest people that they can find to run those systems. Now, I've made that argument before, and somebody responded to me, yeah, but you know, where do you, who's, who's the likelier target? Amazon or my shop? Nobody knows who we are. And I say that if your argument for data security is anonymity, then it's not really a very good argument in my mind. True, Amazon is more, uh, has a higher profile, but they also have the resources to back it up. And I, I personally would trust a company that is investing that kind of money and hiring those people more than I would trust just a handful of people in a room. Um, so anyway, but there's, there's one other point about that, and that's um, when I was preparing for this, uh, specifically this point, I, sh I shared it to a friend and he told me a story. So I'll just tell this little story. His grandfather went to the Toyota plant in the 1970s. And uh, it was right after they had automated production. And they had very quickly become sort of the envy of the automobile production industry, producing cars faster than anywhere else with fewer defects. During one hour, the grandfather, my friend's grandfather asked one of the managers, you know, how can you do this with such consistency and speed and delivery? And he said, the defect lives in the human hand. So if you remove the hand from the process, you remove the, um, sorry, you remove the hand from the process and you get no defects. And a lot of this applies to security as well. So security problems, are almost always defects in the system that are caused by human error. Eliminate the hand, automate the process, and you have superior, superior security. So yeah, obviously when you look after your own servers, security is something you need to keep on top of. And Aaron's right, we're never gonna be as good as security as Amazon are. But we don't need to be that good. Our environment is much simpler than Amazon's. And you know, we're the guys who put it together. We understand between us all of it, because we built it and you know we can therefore control it because we understand it so you know we know which ports should be open which shouldn't be open we know which inputs we should accept which inputs we should reject um, we know where all our software came from we know how to keep it up to date things like that and we do have an advantage and the advantage is if we have an issue we're not reliant on anyone else or anyone else's time scales to get it resolved you know, we, because we put it all together, we know how long it'll take to put it back together. 
Okay, last point for uh, this panel is uh, change and adoption. So yeah, change for us is work, basically. Um, but luckily, as an organisation, we don't have a lot of major change. You know, we're not a dev shop. We, we have a product that we offer, and our product sits in these servers. And for most of the time, despite the security stuff we have to do, they just sit there and get on with it. So this is why self-help, self-hosting makes sense for us. You know, if we were exposed to a lot of change in our production environment, I'd probably do something else. You know. Aaron? Well, I had a different order. Oh, um, I'll take your drink. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay because I actually missed this slide. Apparently I just figured out that I didn't write anything. So uh, <laughs> I'll just wing it. Change is a process. Nobody wants to, um, especially I, I would assume that everybody in this room has been working in the tech industry for a while and has been uh, building sites and, and doing things and you all know how to do it at some level. Well, I would assume most people know how to do it at some level and the way you know how to do it works. So every time that you talk about changing the process and adopting a new process, that's something that we as, as people, human beings, we just shy away from, especially when it's being implemented from somebody somewhere that doesn't really what's, know what's going on. But again, if you have a good system, hopefully it's been built in a way that the learning curve is gonna be to your benefit rather than to your detriment. Okay, yeah, so, um I mean, in terms of like change and disruption um, to your organization moving, um, it depends on the, on the knowledge. It, it kind of circles back a little bit to UX um, and a little bit to skill sharing as well. Um, for sure, you know, with the services that we offer, it's harder for an organization to adopt those services with, with no Linux knowledge or with little Linux knowledge. Um, but obviously, um, we provide training and help and, and tools to make things as smooth and as easy as possible. The whole, the whole purpose of us doing what we do is to try and give you flexibility and freedom of architecture with as little pain as possible in terms of the learning curve for your people. Um, and in my opinion, this point shouldn't be a barrier if you're umming and ahhing about whether to go platform or managed or self-hosted because at the end of the day, in my opinion, the, the, the freedom and flexibility to run your own software, your own hardware, um, and, and call, the, call the shots, train up your staff, et cetera, et cetera. I think they, I think they outweigh um, potentially any sort of training issues you might have or the issues of getting people up to speed. Um, and with the support of a good management company overseeing that for you, um, that doesn't need to be something that scares you away from potentially running your own layout. Um, so yeah, I would say for sure, the learning curve can't be helped. This is this is not amateur stuff. This is you know serious setting up of scary layouts. We'll do most of the work for you, um, but at a certain point, you'll probably need to and want to engage with it and understand it yourselves, um, and and we'll help you do that. Okay, I'm going to allow the guys a brief moment to uh, conclude their arguments and then uh, we're over to you uh, for any questions. So I'm going to say that most people probably shouldn't self-host. Um, you know, because <laughs> like I've said so far, you need the right team, uh, you need a decent connection somewhere to put your servers, uh, you need the ability to predict your load or react fast enough to changes in load, uh, you, need, you need the skills to build and protect your environment. Um, so, you know, it's a good fit for us because we have these things, but, you know, it, it, that may not always be the case. And, you know, if you want to find out if it's the right thing for you, ask your tech team. And if you are your tech team, sit down and have a think. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't kind of thump the tub for any particular approach myself. Um, it's not for no reason that we comfortably partner with a platform provider. Um, at the end of the day, I think that choosing a hosting approach and a hosting product is very individual uh, for every business. Um, I hope that you've got a bit of insight into some of the vectors involved in that. Um, for us, you know, uh, we, we try very much to, to um, 
help customers choose the right approach when they come to us, and it might not be managed service. Uh, we've got um, some customers that start out managed and then end up in-house like, like Roo, uh, and we've got some people that we just say, look, you're a perfect fit for a platform. You know, so it, it, it depends massively. Um, at the end of the day, we just want to support Drupal-based companies to make smart decisions about how they do their hosting and where they do their hosting and, and, and get the best deal for the people that we work with. How did you say that? Thump the tub? <laughs> I will thump the tub. <laughs> <laughs> Platform as a service or nothing. No, actually, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, there are individual cases. There are, there are you, you should be making the right decision for your clients. I, I do stand 100% by, I think, platforms are more flexible, they're, they're, um, they're a very good value offering, and, but they're not the right fit for every single use case. I will accept that, and, uh, and I will even promote that to some Can degree. Can you write it down? <laughs> <laughs> nope, and we know this isn't being recorded. But, uh, <laughs> oh wait, it is, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll conclude on this, and this is, this is the last bit of platform spiel for you. As a Drupal service provider, we see it that there are three primary ways to increase your bottom line, right? You can produce more Drupal, you can, uh, well, you can produce more Drupal, for example, by getting more contracts or bigger contracts. You can increase your services or the scope of your services and what you're offering. And, or the third would be to reduce your costs, right? And in my opinion, if you're using a good platform, you should be able to do all three, right? You should have a more a competitive advantage that allows you to produce more and win bigger contracts. You shouldn't have to add people, so therefore you should be able to reduce your costs. And um, also if you partner with a good pause provider, you can increase the scope, you can you know, become resellers or add hosting as an offering, something that you're using to generate revenue for your business as well. So that would be uh, the, the last statement I'd say is personnel and a good platform increase the efficiency of the development process, allowing you to create more, faster, and with less people. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Rupert, Greg, and Aaron. Uh, it's been a good insight. Uh, we've got a mic over there if anybody would like to come up and uh, present questions to the panel. Oh, shall I put this one back as well? I'll keep it. Yeah. <laughs> I knew when John walked in the room, the first question would be from him. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, okay. Um, so this is hard to answer, but I'm looking for a finger in the air. Uh, CapEx and OpEx on um, 100,000 hits a month and a million hits a month. Go. <laughs> Each one of you. Oh God, I don't know. What's the size of your? Well, how does are you anonymous traffic, authenticated traffic? What are we doing here? <laughs> this, this is finger in the air, but it's Drupal, so you can yeah. assume that there's some authenticated traffic. But I'm assuming it's not normally not much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I, uh, you've just um, uh, so yeah, just just to get uh, just to understand that. So um, essentially, what you're saying is, you know, what 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 would it cost? Are you asking us what it would cost? To, uh, to take the various approaches to host a small website and a big website, basically, is that, that's the question, yeah? Yeah, so to define this really clearly, um, a challenge for a business is that the costs are not defined. Um, and I'm not saying they can be very well, because I've tried myself, you know, as a sysadmin five years ago. Um, but what would be, what, what is good is to kind of see your reasoning on your finger in the air kind of costs behind what it takes to do small site, 100,000 a month you know, medium site, million a month hosting. So think about it in isolation. So you've got to set up all of, because it's, it's got to be separated from everything else. So in isolation, if, if I come to you and I say I'm getting, I've got Drupal, I've got 100,000 hits a month, what price do you give me as a fixed cost? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, app, uh, and that's, and that's, that's um, CapEx and OpEx. Yeah. So of course, monthly. the first question I'd ask you is, well, is high availability important to you? Well. You know, on a million hits a, hits a month, I assume it is. Um, you know, how many yeah. hits am I losing in my downtime? So I, I guess that's something that I would probably ask you, you know, if I'm not technical. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, there's still, well, I guess what I want to highlight here is that, you know, the, the reasoning is important and how close you can give me an answer on this is important right. as a business. Not just what mm. the price is, but but having some certainty around it. Well, I think that's the whole difficulty with the question because, like, you know, you say you, you're talking about 100,000 visits a month website, right? Yeah. But if that's absolutely business critical, we might run that on six servers. If uh, that's just like a, a front-end um, shop window for a busy corporate site, we might run it on a single VM and it'll be fine. Um, so it, it's difficult to say. It could be anything from, you know, like literally like, you know, 300 pounds a month up to Why don't we simplify 000. it? Let's, let's say 100,000 on a brochure site, a million on a commerce site. Right. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah okay. Fair. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I would say, uh, assuming we're providing a server as well, you'd probably be talking about probably around about £200 a month uh, for the 100,000 um, approach. Um, for the million, I don't know, a very finger in the air, I don't know, probably about £1,000 a month, something like that. Okay, so... Uh, I, I don't know like, the, the size of the site, obviously, so let's just, just for sake of argument, we'll assume that it's not very data intensive, doesn't need a massive database. 100,000 hits, um, we could handle that for $50 a month. A uh, million, million hits with a high availability system that has multiple data centers, self-replicatable or replicable, would be about starting point, I think, and I'm just assuming, but I think you could set it up for around $564 a month. Got it. And I would say we're not a hosting company. You need to go and talk to one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, think, I think the interesting point about this is that, and it, is, it, is, it does raise an interesting point, which is that if you're talking about single individual websites, platform probably will normally be more cost effective um, because um, the economies of scale kind of start to make it cheaper per site if you're running multiple sites on, on, a, on a set of infrastructure. Right. So then managed services come into, comes into play. If yeah. You've got a whole lot of separated out properties for one organization and you need a high SLA where they, yeah. they can call in any time of day against any of those properties. Right. Okay. Great question. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Do we have any other questions? <laughs> oh, who, who do you think is the winner? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you don't want to see that. <laughs> all right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you all very much for coming. If you would like to talk with any of us, I have cards here. Um, I've also got a social event tonight. You can find it on the DrupalCon Prague website under social events walking distance from the conference and I'd love to chat with each and every one of you. Tap us on the shoulder. Thanks for coming. Thanks everybody.